Ladies and gentlemen, as part of the Jeremiah Show, welcome to It's Radio with TV's Tim Stack. Now here's the host of the show, a man whose first time on TV was right after being scared to death by a woman on trial for murder in person. It's TV's Tim Stack. Yeah. See you again. You're so sick of me, but I'm back for more. Uh, that was a true story. My first time on TV. Uh, I can tell you when it was. It was the fall of 1969 because I'm old. And my friend Clem Taylor, who was a great TV journalist, won Peabody Awards for 60 Minutes. And we grew up together, best friends. I told a longer version of this story at his memorial. But uh, we're riding home on the bus. And he said, hey, you, that lady's on trial for murder. Mary Maimon, you want to go to the courthouse? And I'm like, yeah. He goes, there are going to be TV cameras there. I said, I'm in because I just wanted to be on TV. That's all. I, and I still do. Uh, so I wanted to be on TV. So we go and he's really excited because the Channel 3 from Philadelphia is there. And this reporter named Malcolm Poindexter, people from Philly will remember him. And um, so Clem starts talking to him. We go into we actually go into the trial. I don't know how we got in. We knew a guy who was a court usher or something. And we get in. We're literally in the front row right behind this lady, Mary Maimon. It's all a true story. Who's on trial for murder. I won't go into the details of this gruesome murder. And all of a sudden the trial starts and the district attorney, we knew we used to caddy for this guy, Ward Clark. And all of a sudden he's about to show these graphic photos from the murder scene. And he looks and he sees us. And it's like one of those looks like, what the heck are you guys doing here? And he stops it. He stops the trial. And he said, uh, I'm going to hold off because there are some uh, younger people here. I don't think should see this. And with that, Mary Maimon, who's literally within touching distance from me, turns around and looks at us and goes, who are you? And she was I mean, it was death in her eyes. Very scary person. We the two of us run out of the place like the three stooges, like we could have run through a wall and left a <laughs> silhouette in the wall. We're so scared. We got outside the TV crews there and all of a sudden Clem takes over and he started and he's, he's 14 years. We're 14 years old, 15. And he starts telling them where they should put the camera to catch the people leaving the trial. And they listen to him. <laughs> so as a reward, I said, hey, guys, Clem really helped you out here. Can you film us and maybe we'll be on TV tonight? Because, again, that's all I wanted. And they put us they shot us. We didn't know if it was going to be on. Sure enough, that night, Channel 3, KYW TV. Uh, the, the announcer goes, well, security was tight at Bucks County Courthouse. And there's a shot of me and Clem. We were on for maybe a second and a half. But anyway, I was on TV and that was my first time on television. So I thought I'd tell that story. Uh, a crazy one. Anyway, I'm really uh, excited. My guest has had a well, let's do the let's let's do the intro. Wow, that's like a top top 40 song. Very good. Okay, my guest has had a very ambitious and eclectic career as anybody I know. In other words, he's more insane than me. Uh, some of his credits, Extreme Home Makeover, World's Most Amazing Vacation Rentals, all shot through COVID. I definitely want to talk about that. And then he goes back to Nashville Star, a big variety show. Uh, and then keep going back. Because he was one of the first guys in as a producer on the show Real World. He did Austin stories. Of course, his biggest credit of all, Tim Stack's Family Vacation. I don't, I don't know if we're going to even talk about that. But there's a clip of it on YouTube. Anyway, please welcome my old friend, George Vashore. Yay! Hello, Tim. Hello, George. The crowd loves you. You forgot to mention Son of the Beach. We're going to get to Son of the Beach. Trust me. But oh, yeah, good, good. George was the George directed the pilot. He got us on the air. 
He directed the pilots on the beach and then some subsequent episodes. And then he actually got a real job. So, <laughs> <laughs> then he started making actual money uh, yes. in show business and doing real shows. Anyway, welcome, George. Thank, Thank you, Jim. So, Thank you. Um, again, you and I have known each other now since Son of the Beach, uh, which was two, 1999. So it's uh -huh. like 24 years. But uh, and I've heard this, but you've had this really eclectic career and done a bunch of different stuff. But I always like to hear people's journeys. Like, how did that start? I know you're from upstate New York, correct? You grew yeah, up in originally originally from uh, Hoosick Falls, New York, right. a little town right on the Vermont border, just uh, east of Albany. Uh -huh. uh, yeah, like it's, it's uh, not a lot happens in Hoosick. Uh, the Grandma Moses was from there. That's our claim to fame. <laughs> How old was she anyway? Because apparently she was famous for being old. Yeah, a hundred and one year old painter. Yeah, that's what she was. So there really was a grandma Moses. Oh yeah, an actual grandma and her. Did you ever meet her? Did I ever meet her? No. I don't know how old. I don't know when she no, when, I, when she think, finally kicked off. I think she died. Well, you know, I don't know. She kicked off sometime in the late nineteen hundreds. I'm not sure okay. when. Okay. Yeah. But I never got to meet her. <laughs> I didn't. Yeah. Anyway, I'll go into. It. I so, did meet Orson Welles. I can tell you a story about Orson Welles. Yeah, Where, go ahead. That's like you know, that was one of my first jobs in Los Angeles. You were just telling a story about you know your run in with the hammer yeah. or whatever her name was. That's what she did. She was right? a hammer. Yes. Jeez. Yes. Yeah, she went to the wrong house and killed the wrong family. Oh, crazy story. You can Google it. Mary Maimon. Yeah. 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 Crazy. Anyway, no, I, my first, I came out, uh, I went to Syracuse University, studied film and television. So you knew when you were a kid, you wanted to do this? No, I had no idea. I was just having a good time as a kid in upstate New York and Vermont. We lived out in the country on a uh -huh. one lane dirt road. Yeah. Uh, you know, three channels of television. I had like a, my bedroom, I had an antenna rigged up so I could get, you know, uh, a radio station from Worcester. So I could get Dr. Demento. On oh, Sunday. sure. Loved him. Remember Dr. Demento? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Syndicated yeah. radio. Absolutely. Yeah. So I would, you know, I was the cool kid because I would come in with tapes of Dr. Demento and everyone, would go, where'd you get that? That was, That's awesome. Because you so, hooked no, up I, an antenna in your room. Yeah, yeah. It's because I could. Or, so anyway, no, I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I got to Syracuse and took a couple of film courses and just fell in love with filmmaking and storytelling. I wasn't a writer. So I was like, you know, how do I, how do I tell stories, you know, in another way? And right. uh, yeah, just got into that and went, went through the new house uh, school there. And uh, so then... a guy named Richard, no, Richard Dugan is the engineer, Dr. <laughs> D. I'll think of his name, Richard, somebody, he was a sitcom writer who went back to teach there. Yeah. 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 No, there's Syracuse has a lot of big names yeah. that came out of there and, um, Aaron Sorkin, you know, Dick Clark, you know, wow. um, yeah. Um, Mike Tirico, who you probably see on sure. football every yeah. year. Yeah. Yeah. He's a big Syracuse guy. Um, anyway, no, then I, me and a buddy, I came out to LA with 400 bucks in my pocket. And how was your family cool with all this or, uh, my family was sort of doing their own thing. I was sort of on my own, my yeah. family, my parents had divorced and oh, okay. I, I was doing my own thing. And so no one really knew what, what I was doing. There's I, George. I heard he went to California. <laughs> yeah. He's, that's a, you know, back then it was the big mythical place, you know, the beach yeah. boys and the Eagles Absolutely. and the doors. And, you know, with it was, this was the Mecca. California did, was did like, you, did you want to live by the beach when you moved to California? Oh, hundred percent. I yeah. came right to Santa Monica. I mean, I did it, the same thing. And people yeah. thought it was crazy because I came out in 79 was like, what are you living way out there for? It's like, you were near the ocean. That's why we moved here. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you're from the Connecticut or where are you Outside from? Outside of Philly. Philly, that's right. Philly, yeah. Philly. Yeah, no, I. it was like the dream, you know, where we all wanted to come to California. It was where you'd seek your fortune. And yeah, so I drove out here with a buddy with a, you know, a duffel bag and 400 bucks in my pocket and started knocking on doors. Yeah. And yeah, and I just worked my way up. I started, you know, I did editing, then I did production management and camera work and just trying to pay the rent. I was living in a 800 square foot house with four guys and I was sleeping in a bunk bed with my roommate or, you know, yeah. my feet would hang off the end of this kid's bunk bed and 
<laughs> yeah, we were we were struggling, uh, but we were having a ball. I mean, those yeah. in those days, I say this often. Those were the days when if you had ambition and you had a dream and you really had a little bit more, you know, grit than the guy next to you, yeah. you could really make stuff happen. I mean, if you just wanted to get in a car and go. You really could. I, I I couldn't agree more. You know, there's a there's a vision that kicks in and you yeah. just sort of go for it and make it happen. And I don't know that you can explain that to people. You just sort of go on automatic pilot. That's right. Yeah, you just do it. And the fun of it was this the discovery. You know, you bump yeah. into somebody or you discover somebody. You go, oh, I have no idea. You know, I got out here and I knew nothing about California. And I started picking up the L.A. Times and I'd look at Oh, look at this club called the Whiskey and the Roxy. And oh, yeah. look at all these bands. And I started going to punk shows and music on the strip back then. And then, oh, it was so much fun. And then you go to Laguna and, you know, Huntington yes. Beach. And I, 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 I kind of oh. had the same experience. I knew a guy out of place in Laguna and I went, it was just like, oh my, this is unbelievable here. Oh, it was like I died and gone to heaven. I mean, yeah. you know, and yeah, so I came out here. And uh, yeah, just started working and worked my way up and started working with Buna Murray on a couple of shows. Buna Murray are the folks that created Real World. So I was working with them and I was working at a production company and I was assigned to work with John and Mary Ellis on this pilot. And I was working with a woman named Delilah Loud. She was my associate at this company. Is she from the Loud family? Yes. I so, would mention because real world, they'll always say like, but I remember as a kid watching the louds, it was American family was the name of the that's show. Right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So Delilah, she's my age and we were working together. And then John and Mary Ellis came in and we did a pilot with them. Um, and we were in Houston and Delilah started telling us all about her experience, having cameras follow her for six months. And then that turned into a TV show. Right. You know, this was, for people who don't know, the An American Family was like a 10-part, I think, PBS series in the yeah. 70s. It was this... I think earlier, Joe. I think even in the 60s. It, it changed it everything, though. It was it was a yeah, game-changing sort of uh, paradigm shift because it was the first reality show. It was following real people. And then, you know, in the course of the filming of the show, you know, one of the brothers came out as having drug issues. The parents separated. Yes. You know, there's all kinds of drama. And Delilah was telling Shot us. Got here in Santa Barbara. That's right. Yes. Yeah, right in Santa Barbara. And uh, and then, then they turned it into actually a scripted show, Cinema Verite, that's on uh, HBO. I didn't know that. Yeah, they did a scripted series about the making of that. Um, but anyway, yeah. So John and Mary Ellis, the... Uh, people the two who created real world they were sitting there at dinner and i this is my version of the origin story of real world right john, john may have a different version but i saw the light bulbs go off and next thing you know they pitched it to mtv shot a pilot and then we we went into new york they bought it and we went to new york and did the first season in 1990 we left in night fall of 1990 and we shot it in the spring of 91 and then right. it aired in the spring of 91 and you know television you know it was a real game changer it really did i mean it really you just have to look back at that i mean you can go back to american family with the louds absolutely but that didn't take off and part of it was mtv you know when you right. look at uh you know the talking heads are suddenly back in in the zeitgeist right now huge but yeah. you look back at that time like a lot of their success was based on videos and mtv just people just watched yeah mtv constantly that's what they put on that's it's right and and they'd made stars out of regular people with their vjs and some of their you know like some of their talent and also just making massive stars out of like you're saying with music videos so in the 80s mtv was pop culture king there wasn't anyone more powerful and and you know as they started to develop and wanting to be their own network they said you know we want our own soap opera right so they came and they said, look, how do we do it? But we got to do it on a budget. We can't yeah. afford the, you know, a union big show like the networks can. So it was sort of born out of economics too, where they said, how do you do that? And so real world, you know, we could shoot that for next to nothing because there were like six of us doing it. Right. <laughs> you know, it was nuts. But we had a small, small crew and we rented a loft in, in Princeton Broadway in New York. And we shot for, you know, 
we shot 13 episodes over, you know, three or four months and just followed these young kids, you know, 24 seven. And it was, you know, go ahead. I was just going to say, and, and looking back on it, I mean, you guys must have been searching at the same time because you're trying to create drama, yet it that's the thing about unscripted television. It's like, yeah, the producers help create stuff, but these people who are on TV better bring stuff with them and create their own conflicts. Yeah, that in that time, it was much more innocent. You know, in the first season of Real World, our approach was very much like palace guard in in those days the documentary filmmaking which we all came out of which much much more pure yeah. in that you don't tell the the subjects what to do you just are a fly on the wall and they do what they want to do interesting so we, we went into it saying like we're the palace guard and only myself and a couple of others could talk to the to the cast right like the crew people would get fired if they talked to the cast and so we were trying not to manipulate it um there were a couple of things where, you know, initially in the first season, MTV was nervous and everyone was nervous. What if nothing happens? And so we were like trying to manipulate and that all backfired. And we had like the cast revolted and said, this isn't a game show. And they threatened to walk. And, you know, and then we said, OK, we're not going to mess with you anymore. We'll just follow you what you do. And yeah. look, if you're going to sit on the couch and drink Kool-Aid and do nothing. Then I'll tell a story about that. Okay. And it was really challenging as a storyteller because then we were like, you had to just tell the story that happened in front of the camera. And yeah, you're right. I mean, some of the cast members understood, hey, I'm going to come across boring unless I do something. Right. Or I, I better, I better start, you know, doing yeah. something because this is a this is going to be my life that's shown on MTV. So they did have an instinct to to make stuff happen, but um, you know, and I think once we actually brought the cast to Jamaica um, and we ended up getting in a crazy situation down there, we got chased by some locals. It was, it was, it got ugly. Okay. And, hold on one second. We got to take our first break, right? Dr. D. Oh, okay. We're going to take our first break. I'm talking to George for sure. So many shows we're talking about his uh, experience. One of the creators of the real world. And I mean, that's how long he's been at it, but then there are a ton of other shows he's worked on and created and I want to get to as many as we can uh, on this show. Anyway, you're listening to It's Radio with TV's Tim Stack. We'll be right back. 